Welcome everyone to CBIA's HR Hotline Live. I'm Diane Mokriski, HR Counsel here at CBIA. So today we're going to be talking about Connecticut's new paid sick leave law. I know you all have a ton of questions about that. We've been getting them for months now. I'm joined by Nick Zaino, an attorney at Carmody Sandek. Um, I'm sorry, Carmody Torrance Sandek in Hennessy. I'm so used to it just being Carmody Torrance. Um, and so Nick is a partner at the firm, and he is a specialist in all things employment law. So Nick, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Awesome. Thank you, Diana. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, we know we have a very big group, and we do want to turn to your questions. What we thought we would do first, though, is just go through a few slides that cover some of the basic requirements under Connecticut's new sick leave law, just to sort of level set everyone. And so we'll go through those and then turn to all of your questions. Of course, the information that we provide is not considered um, attorney client privilege information. It doesn't consider, not considered legal advice is for educational purposes. So with that, um, let's get started. Uh, the new sick leave law was signed by Governor Lamont on May 28th of this year, 2024. It's effective January 1st, 2025. And if you wanna read the text of the law, it's Public Act 24-8. It changes a lot of components of the existing sick leave law. Um, it expands coverage to more employers and then eventually over time, uh, nearly all employers. Currently, the law only applies to employee, employers with 50 or more employees and excludes most manufacturers, so that would go away. Um, the new law will extend coverage to more employees and again, eventually nearly all employees, uh, whereas the current law um, only applies to service workers. Um, the new law will increase the rate that employees accrue sick time. Currently, it's one hour uh, for every 40 hours worked, um, but eventually it'll be one hour for every 30 hours worked. The new law will ex expand the instances when sick leave may be taken. It expands the list of family members for whom sick leave may be taken. It modifies the rules for availability of coverage. It restricts employers from requiring minimum notice from employees um, or documentation, and it adds new notice, record retention, and other obligations on employers. And again, we'll cover some of these basic points. Um, as I mentioned, the new law gradually expands coverage to apply to nearly all employers, including public and private employers, for-profit, not-for-profit employers. So effective January 1, 2025, it'll apply to employers with 25 or more employees. January 1, 2026, um, 11 or more employees. And then January 1, 2027, it'll apply to all employers that have one or more employees. How do, you do, how do you know if you're covered as an employer? You look at the number of employees that you have on your payroll as of January 1st annually. What employees do you count? You count all employees who work in Connecticut, including full-time, part-time, and per diem employees. Um, as I mentioned, there's no more exception. Once this law takes effect on January 1st, uh, there are no more exception for manufacturers. And there are only very few employers that are exempt from this law. They are employers, of course, with fewer than the number of employees to be covered. So if you don't meet those thresholds on January 1st, then, then you're not covered. Self-employed individuals, and there's this unique exemption for employers that participate in a multi-employer health plan that's maintained for, pursuant to a collective bargaining agreement between a construction-related union and an employer. And so what I would suggest is if you think you fall within that exemption, I would discuss that with your counsel. It's not really clear to us why that's included in the, in the statute. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, get uh, legal advice on that specific question. So if you're a covered employer, then under the new law, nearly all of your employees working in Connecticut are covered or eligible employees. This includes full-time, part-time, per diem, hourly, and salaried employees. The only exception um, are seasonal employees, and that's defined as those employees who work, um, and that word is very intentional, who work only 120 days or less per year. So you look at the total number of days that somebody works to determine whether or not they meet that definition of a seasonal employee. However, once that employee, that seasonal employee works 121 days or more, then they would be entitled to the amount of paid sick leave that they had accrued from day one. Um, so you have to be careful about hiring seasonal employees and tracking their, the days that they work, knowing that once they cross that 120 day work threshold, they will be eligible for sick leave based on all the 
prior time that they had worked. Um, under the new law, eligible employees begin to accrue upon hire or January 1. If they're hired, um, if they're if they're in current employees, they begin to accrue on January 1. If they're new hires after January 1, they accrue after they're hired. The rate that they accrue is one hour for every 30 hours worked, and it's capped at 40 hours per year. So you only accrue, employees only accrue based on hours worked, not hours paid. A year um, is any 365 day period that you use to calculate employee benefits. So it doesn't need to be the calendar year. Um, whoops, sorry, what about exempt employees? Um, employees who are exempt from overtime pay who don't track their hours worked? Well, the law says that exempt employees are presumed to work 40 hours each week for purposes of sick time accrual unless you can show that they actually work less than 40 hours per week, in which case they accrue based on their actual hours work. Otherwise, the working presumption is that exempt employees work 40 hours per week. What if you front load? You know, front load means you provide all 40 hours right up front, then you don't need to worry about the accrual. You're, you're making that full 40 hours available right at the outset of your year. Um, be careful, however, about prorating um, or front loading on a prorated basis for part-time employees. In other words, just because you have a part-time employee who works, who generally works, let's say 20 hours a week, and you say, okay, I'm only gonna front load 20 hours, that may not be enough. You have to actually track the hours to determine whether or not they accrued more than that front-loaded amount um, that, you, that you give if it's less than 40. So be careful about front, prorating front-loading for part-time employees. When is a new employee eligible to use accrued sick time? Um, they're eligible to use it 120 calendar days after their date of hire. So this is a little different than the definition of what is a seasonal employee. So it's 120 calendar days after they start employment, they're eligible to use the accrued sick time um, that they have. It's a one-time requirement. So once an employee meets that 120-day threshold, they've worked for you for 120 days, it doesn't need to be met again if they're rehired or if there's a successor what's considered a successor employer. Um, employers can use um, paid sick leave in one hour increments, but not less than that. You don't have to allow employees to use it in less than one hour increments. And again, you have the front loading option as long as you front load the total amount that the employee um, is due under the statute. Um, what if, so in a covered um, employee may use, I think I mentioned this paid sick leave after 120 days uh, of employment and that's calendar days of employment. Carry over, there's no change from the current law. So up to 40 hours of accrued um, sick leave can be carried over into the next year, but employees are not uh, entitled to use unless you allow it more than 40 hours of paid sick leave per year. So they can carry it over, but you don't have to allow them to use more than 40 hours of paid sick leave per year. And what are the different reasons that an employee can go on leave? Um, I'm gonna go through the specific reasons, but before we do, I just wanna note, there is a um, significant expansion of the definition of a family member. Um, the statute now uses the same definition that's used under the Connecticut Family and Medical Leave Act, and it's on your screen. You know, it's worth noting that it also includes those individuals um, who the employee shows to be equivalent to a family member. Um, also, a child is considered, um, is any child at any age, it includes biological, adopted, foster child, stepchild, legal ward of an employee who stands in loco parentis, grandchild is anyone related to a person by blood, marriage, adoption, foster care, parent includes a biological foster, adoptive parent, step parent, parent in law, legal guardian of an employee or an employee's spouse. Sibling is a brother or sister related to the employee by blood, marriage, adoption, or foster care placement. So brother-in-law, sister-in-law. And a spouse is a person who's legally married to an employee under the laws of any state or a domestic partner of an employee. So a very expanded, uh, very expanded definition of family members. What are the reasons that an employee can, can use paid sick leave? Um, and it's up on your screen, the employee or their family member, their covered family member, as an illness, injury, or health condition, um, for a medical diagnosis, care, or treatment for mental or physical illness, injury, or a health condition, 
or preventative care for mental or physical health. So that applies for the employee or their family member. Um, it also allows employees to use sick leave um, where they or a family member is a victim of family violence or sexual assault, provided, of course, the employee is not the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator of that family violence or sexual assault. Keep in mind that the Connecticut, um, Connecticut law allows employees to use 12 days of unpaid leave if they are a victim of family violence, but that 12 days is in addition to the sick leave. So somebody can take five, five days of sick leave um, if they're a victim of family violence, plus an additional 12 days under a separate Connecticut statute. Um, an employee can also use a sick day um, for a mental health wellness, and that is broadly defined as um, the employee taking any time off for their own emotional or psychological well-being. Okay, so that's for the employee's mental mental health. In addition, uh, these are new reasons for leave uh, for sick leave. Um, so one would be the employer's place of business is closed by an order of a public health official due to a public health emergency, or a family member's school or place of care is closed for some reason. And then the second one is the determination by a health authority, um, employer of the employee, employer of a family member, or a healthcare provider that an employee or their family member poses a risk to the health of others due to an exposure to a communicable disease, whether or not that family member actually contracted the communicable illness. So that sort of relates back to what we all lived through not that long ago. If you think of COVID, it's, it's similar to that. What about notice and documentation? How much notice does an employee have to give an employer under the new law? Now, the new law eliminates the language that says an employer may require advance notice. Um, the, the law does not require employees, does not affirmatively require employees to provide their employer any advance notice of their need to use paid sick leave, even if that paid sick leave is being used for a reason that's foreseeable. What about documentation? Um, the new law says that employers are prohibited from requiring employees to provide any documentation that their leave is being taken for a permitted purpose. So huge change there. Um, there are some new record retention requirements for employers. Um, employers must keep track of the number of hours of any paid sick leave accrued by or provided to the employee and the number of hours of paid sick leave used by the employee during the calendar year. And this relates back to a statute um, that requires you to provide wage, you know, wage payment information to employees. And so most employers will simply include the amount of sick time or, or track it on the uh, pay stubs that they give to their employees. Um, that information must be maintained for three years, and you must allow the, the Connecticut Department of Labor access to those records if there's if there's ever an audit. If you fail to do that, you're subject to a hundred dollar civil penalty for each violation. Some other things, um, and, and there are other miscellaneous requirements, but there's some that we just wanted to point out. Um, first, an employer cannot require an employee to find coverage for his or her shift when using sick time, so you can't force an employee to say, you need to find somebody to cover for you. Um, you know, With regard to notice, employers are required to display a poster in a conspicuous place accessible to employees, and the Connecticut DOL has created a model poster that you can use um, that poster must be in English and in Spanish. It must be provided to employees by January 1, 2025, um, or at the time that they're hired, whichever is later. And if you have remote employees, you have to send that poster uh, via email to each remote employee or publish it on a digital platform that employees um, know about and that they have access to. There, of course, is no retaliation or discrimination against an employee who uses sick time um, you're not required to pay out sick time upon separation of employment. Um, if an employee's wages vary from week to week and you're saying, well, how much do I have to pay an employee for sick time if their, uh, their hourly rate um, varies, the, stat the regulations, the statute says that you have to take the average rate that they had in the prior payroll period. Um, if you're asking, well, we have a paid time off policy, can we continue to have a paid time time off policy? The answer in short is yes, as long as that paid time off policy checks all the boxes that are required under the Connecticut paid sick leave law. There is a DOL complaint process um, for employees who feel that the employer has not followed the paid sick leave law. There's no private cause of action. However, the, employ the uh, DOL 
can uh, assess civil penalties, reinstatement, back wages, and provide the employee benefits that they lost as a result of any violation of the law. So what should employers do? You know, of course, become familiar with the new requirements under the law, which I think all of you are doing. Review your current paid time off policies and evaluate what changes need to be made. Um, educate your managers on the reasons that somebody can take sick leave, which you know far are uh, far more expansive than than current. And then, of course, uh, make sure you've got your policy in place, your posters um, ready to distribute by January first. So, with that, I know I went through a lot in about yeah. twenty minutes. Um, so, let's <laughs> go. Let's through, get started. Let's get people started are, with all the questions. Yeah, people are eager. I just want right. to say, Nick, you you mentioned this already, but there's kind of one blanket statement we can make that I think will answer a lot of these questions, and that is that if you have a PTO policy right now, and it's a bucket policy where you can use that PTO for being sick for personal time, for vacation, for anything at all. If you have that policy and it's just called PTO, you don't have to give any additional time for paid sick leave as long as it's as generous as the law requires, which is mean which means people accrue it at the at, at least the right rate and you follow the rules about not requiring any documentation then that you don't have to change that policy. You can still have your PTO policy because it's as least as generous as the law requires. Is there, are you getting that question all the time? Nick, that's probably the all, most common question. Yeah, all the time. And you have to ensure that the PTO policy, at least for the first 40 hours, meets all the requirements of the sick leave law. So in other words, employees can use PTO, at least the first 40 hours of PTO for all the reasons that are covered under the sick law, leave law. Beyond that, you've got way more latitude. Yeah, and so if you have a PTO policy and you don't care like you don't care if people are using it for vacation versus sick, then you're probably not going to require a doctor's note anyway, right? Like you don't care why they're using exactly. it. It's just PTO. Exactly. Yep. So great. Have that PTO policy and have everything be in one bucket and that's probably the easiest way to go. Mm -hmm. Um so let's get started with some questions. The very first question has to do with uh, similar to what I just said. So the current PTO policy gives a certain number of hours, 80 hours for people who are newish between zero and four years. And it gives more hours of PTO if you've been working there longer. Should we consider separating that out? Do you have an opinion on that? I mean, I think it, it, I think you still have latitude to have different PTO buckets for, for employees that have different years of service. You just need to look at your policy and, and just make sure it checks the boxes you know, that are required under the sick leave law. In other words, do employees accrue PTO um, you know, at the rate required under the sick leave law? At least for the first 40 hours, you have to allow that. And so, you know, and you have to allow employees for the first 40 hours of their PTO to be able to use it for any of the purposes allowed under the sick leave law, right? And you have to pay it at the proper rate under the sick leave. Um, statute. So, you know, you can continue to have, and we've written these policies for employers where there's still PTO policies, but you got to make sure that that PTO policy meets the requirements of the sick leave statute with regard to the first 40 hours at least. Right. Okay. So the second question has to do with temporary employees. So this is going to maybe touch on the seasonal employee issue. Um, will temporary employees be eligible after 121 days? Yeah, so the definition of seasonal employee, for first, when you hire someone, it should be clear when you hire them, whether they're being hired as a regular full-time employee, a regular part-time employee, a seasonal worker, a temporary worker, right? A seasonal worker um, is defined under the statute as someone who works works 120 days or less per year. And so if they work 120 days or less per year, they're considered a seasonal employee and they're not eligible for any sick leave time under the Connecticut statute. If they work 121 days or more, then they're no longer considered technically a seasonal employee under the sick leave statute, and they are entitled to use um, the amount of sick time that they, they had been accruing or should have been accruing from day one. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, you can call them seasonal, you can call them temporary. The, the, the million dollar question is 121 days, right. really. Once they work 121 days, 
you then you have to look back to all the hours they've been crewing for the past 120 days, right? Yes. And then they can use their their PT their paid sick time. Uh, so existing employees who will be affected by this law, they'll start accruing January 1st, yep, versus Correct. getting the full 40 up front, unless, right, unless you want to front load. So the the minimum amount, the minimum requirement that the, that the law requires is that you start accruing January 1st. Exactly. But if you would yeah. like to front load everything, 40 right away, you can do that too. Yeah, and some employers have done that, you know, where they're where they don't want to have to go through and sort of track the number of hours and then take that for each 30 hours work, dump it into sort of a sick leave bucket. Some employers have just said, you know, for our full time employees, you know, as they define full time, we're just going to give them the full amount of 40 hours, you know, where it gets a little and just front load the full 40 hours where it can get a little tricky is let's assume we have part time employees don't automatically assume that because they're part-time, say 20 hours a week, that front-loading 20 hours is going to be sufficient to meet the sick leave statute because they may end up accruing more than 20 hours of sick leave depending on the number of hours that they work. So be careful the amount that you front-load if it's less than 40. You still sort of need to keep your eye on how many hours are they actually working and did they accrue more than the amount of hours you're front loading. So if you front load 40, you're not gonna have an issue. If you front load less than that, you may still need to track the hours work to see if you've front loaded enough. All right, uh, what about, some, um, what'd you say, Nick, go ahead. No, 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 definitely something, you know, a lot of employers I've dealt with have just sort of, but you know, we're just gonna front load just to make it simple, but. So what about um, temp agencies? Who employs the employee from a temp agency? So that, you know, the the FAQs that the DOL put out, and I was looking to see if they had something specifically on that, but I think the, the obligation falls on the temp agency as the W-2 employer of that employee. And so I would think the temp agency is responsible for ensuring that their temporary employees who work, right, more than 120 days in a year um, do accrue sick leave under the statute. Yeah, so that'll actually be interesting if you, you if you have a temp if you have a temporary employee that you got from a temp agency, that employee may have worked more than 120 days for their employer, the temp agency, right? Making them eligible for paid sick leave even though they only worked for you for a few for days, right? Yeah, yeah. That's why I think the obligation would fall on the temp agency as the W two employer of that employee. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, is it? Uh, is accrued is accrued unused sick time paid out when the employee leaves? Yeah, so the statute does not require you to pay out accrued but unused sick time. And so that just depends on your policies. So if you have a policy or a practice of paying out accrued but unused sick time and you want to continue that policy or that practice, you can do so. If you don't want to have a practice of paying out accrued but unused sick time, and this applies to vacation and any other paid time off, you don't have to pay out that time upon separation of employment. So you've got wide latitude to set the rules on when you want to pay out, if you ever do, accrued but unused paid time off, including sick, vacation, or personal time. Okay. So what if what if the employee works a seven hour day? Um, hold on. Uh, just so you know, CBIA, when you delete the questions, they go, <laughs> okay, what if we work a 7.25 hour day, would we need to give the full 40 hours or our standard work week of 36.25? I think what they're saying there, so it doesn't matter. It the, the answer I think to that question is it really only matters ultimately how many hours they're working and for every 30 they get one exactly up to a maximum of 40 so your policy of the 7.25 and the 37.25 that kind of doesn't matter anymore exactly right yep and there should be i you know there is software out there that that tracks the number of hours that somebody works again not necessarily paid so you don't count holidays you don't count vacation it's the hours that they actually work and so every time they tally up 30 hours, one hour gets dropped into the sick leave bucket or a PTO bucket, if that's the way you provide your paid time off. Um, 
And so I kind of like that as a personal plug. Like I kind of like that idea that employees who work get some time put into either their sick time or their whole, their entire PTO system. You know, it sort of makes it easy when somebody's on a leave, right? A leave of absence and they're not working, they're not accruing. They're clearly not accruing because they're not, they're not working. And so for every, you know, so for every hour that you work, you know, a little bit gets put into that sick leave or PTO bucket. Okay. So is the year based on a calendar year or from the date of hire? That depends on how you want. So the, tr the, the accrual begins, the accrual begins when they're hired. January 1st, if they're an existing employee of 2025 at the rate of one hour for every 30 hours work. If they're hired after January 1st, they begin accruing at the date of hire and they're eligible to take the time off after 120 to calendar days of employment. And then it's up to you as to decide how you want to define your year. You don't have to use the calendar year. You can use the hire date, you know, each employee's hire date as a 365 day period. Okay. Uh, so for the staffing firms, do we classify everyone as seasonal until they work 120 days? I think I would probably say yes. Yeah, I would think so too, because you don't really know unless you have an assignment that clearly is going to go beyond that, right? Yeah. Um, yep. Okay. Our PTO policy specifies that employees must use 32 of the 80 hours of PTO granted during our summer shutdown. Uh, are we compliant? I 30, yeah, so that leaves 40... 30, you said 32 of 80, Diane, was that the question? <laughs> Make us do math um, here. Um, meaning they have 48 hours of PTO that they can use at any time during the year, right? And so yeah. as long as they're allowed to use up to 40 hours, if they've accrued 40 hours of sick time, you know, you have to ensure that your PTO policy allows them to be able to use up to 40 hours of accrued sick time for any of the reasons identified in the statute. So even given the total amount that you provide, that that might be okay, as long as your policy makes that clear. Yeah, so that the, all these restrictions about, you know, how often you accrue the hours, what you can use them for, that only applies to 40 hours. And so that's why, Nick, you were trying to distinguish between the 32 of the hours and the remaining right. hours. So 40 of those hours are very restricted. The other hours. Exactly. Yeah. So you can probably say in your in your PTO policy that 32 of the 40 must be taken at this time, but the remaining 48 hours can be for any of the following reasons. And you've got to ensure that those reasons include all the yeah. all the reasons that somebody can take sick leave. All right. The employee count on January 1st, 2025. That is correct. Yes. Yes. Um, and then each January, for those of you who are below the threshold, each January after that. Okay. Can your policy front load for exempt and be an accrued policy for hourly? Yeah, I don't see why not. You can do that. I mean, as long as you, again, as long as each, each employee gets what they're entitled to under the statute and can use that sick time for all the reasons that the statute identifies. Yeah. If you can have a different system where you front load for one group of employees, exempts, and, and accrue for the non-exempts. A little cumbersome okay. maybe to track, but if you can do it, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, our okay. current policy states that employees must use PTO in increments of half a day or a full day. Should we revise this? Yes. Yes, they have to be allowed to use it in increments of one hour. I should stop sharing. There's no need. Do you want me to stop sharing the screen or? Uh, you're fine the way, yeah, this okay. slide is fine. Right. That's fine. Um, yeah, so the law requires that you allow people to use one hour or more. So you can't limit it to half a day. Correct. You can over the 40, right? So that's an yep. example if you have a PTO policy um, and, you know, you want to say that after somebody's used 40 hours for sick leave purposes, you know, over that, you can limit it to half day increments. Yeah, I'm going to, there's this, there's a question from Anonymous at 109. I'm going to come back to that because it's a little long. Um, but so 
uh, don't erase that CBIA. I think I, I just want to come back to that. It's very specific. Okay. Um, going on to the next one. If we define it as PTO versus sick and vacation, should we follow the same PTO rollover policy? So. I'm not sure I understand the question. If um, I if you say that again, if you define it as yeah. PTO. We define it as PTO. Should we follow the same PTO rollover policy? I think the answer to that question is that if you're going to put this paid sick leave time into a general PTO bucket, then you're going to have to follow the law with regard to rollover, which means that any unused time, you're supposed to let that employee roll it over to the following year. So let us know if that didn't answer that question. But if you're lumping everything into one bucket, then everything in that bucket within that first 40 hours has to follow the law's requirements. Yeah. And the law's requirements are that you allow people to roll over their time, unused time. Yeah, you, you could try to parse it. I mean, you could parse it. If you give, let's say you give, let's say you give 160 PTO hours, right? Um, you could say that employees may carry over up to 40 PTO hours into mm -hmm. the next year. You know, you can say that so you don't have to allow all the PTO to carry over into the following year. But again, you have to at least ensure that um, the 40 hours that might be used for sick leave does get to get carried over just as you would if you had a separate sick leave policy. All right, my employer owns four businesses in, in Connecticut. Only one has over 25 employees. Does the law include the total of all four locations in Connecticut or each location individually? That's a good question. I'd have to double check that, but if it's one employer and it just happens to have four locations or four divisions, right, four, four physical sites, then the entire, it's not, this isn't based by site, it's based by employer that has the coverage requirements is gonna be required to comply with sick leave law. If there are four separate entities, right? And they're not necessarily interrelated, then I think you look at each entity and that's a very simplistic answer. I'd wanna go back and look at the statute on that. At least that's how it is for most employment laws that mm -hmm. if it's not a common employer or there are four separate entities, you know, different, different sort of business units, mm -hmm. um, then you look at each one. But if it's one employer, or just four locations, then you look at the the employer overall. All right. Uh, what's a seasonal employee? A seasonal employee is someone who works 120 days or fewer. Um, is the first 40 hours of sick time protected, meaning the employer cannot count this towards a disciplinary act? Correct. You cannot. You cannot discipline an employee for using 40 hours of sick time, you know, just as you couldn't discipline somebody for using family and medical, you know, time under the Family Medical Leave Act. So you have to disregard the first 40 hours. And if you're going to discipline someone or take any kind of adverse action against somebody for excessive absenteeism, you've got to disregard the first 40 hours that are under the sick leave that are taken under the sick leave statute. So it's got to be excessive beyond that. Yeah, I guess with the only caveat, and this is kind of tricky with this statute, if you, if your employee ends up taking sick time and they're not actually sick and the reason they're absent doesn't comply with the law, you can discipline them. The problem is there's no way for you to really find that out because you can't require any documentation. Exactly so, right. I think it'd be very, very risky. Yeah. You know, I think the law allows somebody to just call in and say, I'm not feeling well today. Yeah. You know, I'd like to use this day as a sick day. And that's that's good enough. They don't need to give you more information than that. You couldn't deny it on that basis because you know, and there's you know, and you couldn't discipline them because you think that yeah. they're not actually sick. And, you know, you get into all kinds of scenarios where, oh, they posted on Facebook that they were at, you know, X place. And, you know, I don't think they were really sick. And, you know, there may be opportunities where you can challenge that. But I think. You know, I'd be wary of that. Just be very careful about that. All right, I'm on to uh, Alyssa Hamilton. If our PTO plan accrual is more generous than the Connecticut sick leave, are we okay not to add additional sick time? Yes. 
Good, moving on to uh, Jamie. I offer PTO, which they can use for sick time or anything they want. Does this meet the sick time criteria, assuming they get one hour for each 30 worked? Yep, that's good. Like you don't need any yeah. additional. Um, is the mental health day included in the 40 hours? Yeah, they can use up to one day or yes, for a mental health, they can use sick time for a mental health wellness day in, in as little as one hour increment. Yeah, although that's funny that you just said that last that last phrase because it's a mental health wellness day. And that is not really defined in the statute. And so I don't think you can take an hour of mental health wellness on one day and then another hour on another day. Yeah, I mean, look, it gets a little, um, I'm envisioning the employee who's at work and it's three o'clock and they normally finish at five o'clock and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm just not feeling well, I need to go, right? Yeah. That person, you'd have to allow them to go. They're not, they tell you they're not feeling well that day. They can take it in less in one hour increments. Right. Right. I don't know how you can say, no, you have to stay here. You know, so some of it is just, yeah, I mean, maybe you have to look back at the mental health wellness day. Maybe that needs to be taken in a full block. Good question, Diane. I don't know for sure. Yeah, I think so. In that scenario that you described, it's three o'clock. You don't feel well. You go home. You take two hours of um, paid sick leave. I don't think I call it a mental health wellness day, though. True. <laughs> like, just, you only just get one of those. Yeah. Like, you get one yeah. day. Yeah. So for everyone out there, they didn't really define that in the statute. It's just a day. It's a day that you normally would have showed up for a shift, which is also undefined. But instead of showing up for that shift, you say you need a mental health wellness day and you yeah. get those. Okay. Regarding the 25 or more employees, are owners of the company counted as one of the 25? And our eligible work, okay, we did the temp agency. What do you think about owners? I would say not if they're not on the payroll, right? So if you're not paid as an employee, you're paid as an owner, um, then no, that's my sense of it. Yeah, I think that's gonna be a tax issue, right? You either go get a W-2 or you don't, or it depends how your corporation is organized. And yeah, so um Talk to the owner about that and figure out how they're paid. And that'll tell you if they, if you count them as an employee. Exactly. Uh, yep. One mental health day per year. I think if someone requests a second day, you can deny it. That is my opinion. That may not For be. mental health. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Okay. Um, family members, school is closed. Does this include snow days? I think it does. What do yep, you think? I would agree. I agree. Okay. Um, if an employee is only given, I, I'm sorry, we're going through these so fast, yeah, but there's, there's a lot hundreds of, of questions. Okay. Uh, if an employee is only given 40 hours of PTO each year, should the company give them more PTO per year? Nope. Okay. Uh, there's no additional. So again, this law does not require you give any more sick time. If you already have give 40 hours that can be used for a sick time. Uh, if we have PTO versus sick and vacation, does the record retention guidelines still apply? Yeah, PTO. So the, the record retention is very specific to sick days. And so it requires you to keep track of the amount of sick days that somebody has accrued and that the amount of sick days that the person has used. And so you can't avoid that by calling it a PTO policy. So you need to track at least that information. And if you're going to track that, you might as well track all the PTO under your policy. But at a minimum, you've got to do the sick, the sick time accrued and the sick time used. All right, I'm up to uh, anonymous at 114. If the employee leaves during the year, do I have to pay them for the unused sick time? No. No. Uh, we only use the code P. Okay, nope, you don't have to separate the, um, actually, Nick, do you want to talk about, you were just talking about that with regard to records. Um, you want to just clarify that? If yeah, we what's only the, use the code it? PTO, right. which is both vacation and sick, yep. do we now need to separate the two? 
And the only reason I hesitated was the records, keeping the records. Yeah, so I think um, I think you're going to have to either separate or, or track all the PTO because you have to, and, and your policy should make very clear that they can use PTO for all the sick reasons, for all the reasons that an employee is allowed to use sick leave. I think if you do that, um, well, no, you, yeah, you probably do need to separate it because then you have to ensure that the employee was allowed to use at least 40 hours of your PTO for all the reasons that um, are permitted under the sick leave law. So it probably would be prudent to separate, maybe it's PTO and then PTO dash S for, for sick, you know, those hours when you, you know, unless you allow employees to use all the PTO that you allow for sick leave mm -hmm. reasons, then mm -hmm. you don't need to do that. But if you limit it to 40 hours, then yeah, I think you do need to track which of the PTO hours or days are for the covered sick law uh, leave reasons. Yeah. So when so when we're talking about, you know, when do you and when do you not need to separate these things out? Really, the issue is just that the Labor Department wants to know that you are providing the minimum amount of sick time and they want you to keep records of it. And so you have to do that on their pay stub. And so if you're just coding everything PTO, that's OK, as long as you're giving 40 hours of PTO that can, and all of it can be used for sick, right? Do you agree with that? And then if I that's agree. on the pay stub and you're keeping track how much the employee has used, are you with yeah, me? I do, do you... Yes, I do agree with that. Okay. I think I think you have to be able to show that. Yeah, okay. Okay, can the employer request a doctor's note to state that the employee is able to return to work? Yeah, so I I don't think you can um, because I don't think you can ask for a note on the um, because you can't ask for a note to support the need for sick leave. I don't see how you can ask, assuming this is not an FMLA situation, right? Let's assume this doesn't fall under FMLA. It's just a single day or two days that an employee is out because they're sick. If you don't have the right to ask for a note to support those two sick days, then I don't see how you have the right to ask for a note to ensure that they're fit to return to work, at least under the sick leave law, right? And so if you condition that, yeah. if you make that a requirement um, and you take disciplinary action for failing to give you that note, I think you run the risk of violating the sick leave statute. Yeah, I guess if the, you know, I don't, if, if the employer has some, I bet that's gonna be very fact specific. If the employer has some reason to believe that the employee really is not fit for duty, you know, like they're, they they have some basis to believe that, yeah, they, that was fine that they took the sick time. I don't have a, that this is the employer talking. That's yeah. fine, they took sick leave, but I don't think they're ready to come back. That doesn't seem safe. I need a fitness for duty note. Yeah, see that, that would be more like yeah. an ADA type issue, like. Totally, yes. Yeah. And I'm envisioning, yes, obviously we don't wanna lose our common sense. Like if somebody is taking a sick leave day, um, and you have some independent reason to really question why, whether they're able to come back to work, you know, in that unique circumstance, remember we're only talking up to 40 hours. And so, you know, typically in those scenarios we require fitness for duty, somebody's got a severe illness, a, you know, significant, you know, Ill, you know, disability or, or medical condition that renders them unable to work. But I wouldn't make that a matter of policy that if you use a sick day, you've got to give us the fitness for duty to yeah. come back to work. Like that's got to be a very unique circumstance where you would require that. All right. Do we need to provide leave accrued and used on pay stubs? Our software does not do that. And we are going to be eligible January 1st. Yes, I think you do. I mean, the statute does require you to track, you know, the leave that they've accrued and the leave that they have used. And it relates back to the wage payment. Um, wage payment statute, which requires you to provide a pay stub to your employees, a written pay stub or electronic if they agree. And so you have to show it on that pay stub. Yeah. No exceptions for nonprofit organizations. That is correct. Um, oh, this is a good question. So if you're, uh, if you're a small enough employer so that you're not required to comply until 2026, is notice still required to be provided on January 1st, 2025? 
You look that up. I'm going to move to the next one. Look that up. My gut says no, but I can look that up. Okay. Um, can you review the no notice has to be given on time? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yes, the statute does not require that employees give notice to their employers that they need sick time. It is probably, this is something that Nick and I were talking about the other day, it is probably okay for you to have an employer policy that asks employees to give you notice of their need for sick time. The tricky part is that that used to be specifically in the statute, it's now been removed. And so the, st the statute is silent on that issue. And so the statute doesn't require that the employees give notice, but you can probably, as an employer, require that they give notice. Yeah, and I think there's room. I was thinking more about that, Diane. I think there's room yeah. for that argument in the statute because the language that was removed basically said employees may require employees to provide advance notice if the need for sick leave is foreseeable, right? Something along those lines. That language was removed. So the statute says, so where they wanted to prohibit you from doing something, they made that very clear. The statute makes it very yeah. clear that employers are prohibited from asking for medical, any documentation to support the need for sick leave. The statute doesn't say employers are prohibited from requiring employees to provide advance notice of leave. So I think that argument, even in the statutory context, that um, that argument is available to employers. You know, the fact that they deleted that language is a little curious and maybe a counter argument to that. Yeah. But I do think there's room to make that argument that under your normal policies, you know, you ask employees to provide, um, you should at least say you request employees to provide you advance notice if the need for sick, to use sick time is foreseeable, like an appointment, a medical appointment. Yep. And just for Wanda, so to confirm, you, and you may not require documentation. Correct. Uh, yes. We address the PTO bucket on the check stub issue. Um, if we require employees, I'm now at 1.16 p.m. If we require employees to be present during a high production season and an employee unexpectedly misses work due to an illness, no, you cannot request a doctor's certification right. if that is within the first 40 hours of their PTO. Um, I'm now just scrolling down to, uh, uh, does the, I'm at 116, does this mean we can no longer request medical certification when an employee is requesting FMLA? No, I don't think that's the case. I think if somebody if somebody um, is out for a reason that may qualify under the Connecticut Family Medical Leave Act or the federal, you still have the right under that law to request that they fill out a medical certification form, that their provider fill out that medical certification form. I don't think this eliminates your obligation to track and designate time as FMLA. But remember, the definition is you know, is different than what the sick leave, the definition of a serious health condition under the Family Medical Leave Act doesn't, doesn't line up. It's not the same definition as the reasons why somebody can take sick leave. So just because they're taking sick leave doesn't automatically mean that it would be FMLA. So FMLA generally kicks in when somebody has, is absent for a reason, you know, for four or more days, right? Then you have the right to determine whether or not that's a serious health condition and ask the employee to fill out a medical certification form or have their provider fill it out. Yeah, there's a lot of questions about FMLA. It um, FMLA tends to be a longer, more serious health issue. And so, yeah, you have to, it, it, we understand it seems inconsistent. Legislators aren't really good at that. Um, and in some cases it will be inconsistent, but if you believe that an employee has an FMLA covered serious health condition, then you then you can require that doctor's note. Okay, regarding notifying employees, this is about the posters and the notices. Um, can we put it in the break room? And if they're remote, can we send it to them via email? Say yes to both. 
Yeah, and we can put in the chat, there's a link, this is also in Nick's slides, but there's a link to the Labor Department site um, that we'll put in the chat and that's where you go to get the poster, which is free. And so you're supposed to post the poster and then also email it to your employees beginning January 1st. Yeah, I mean, on the prior question about notice. Um, yes. It says each employer subject to the provisions of sections 31-57 S as amended by this act shall at the time of hiring provide notice to each employee, blah, blah, blah. So it looks like that applies once the employer is subject to the provisions of the sick leave law. So that would mean if you're not subject until the year 2026, that's when you have to provide the notice. The, the specific notice to each employee, but the, the poster is, the language is a little bit different. So the poster, it looks like each employer shall comply with the provisions of, by displaying a poster. So just to be safe, might as well print out that poster, put that up. We sh you should probably put it up. You might as well just put it up soon. It's gonna take effect in a couple months, let people know there's something going into effect. If you're not subject to this law until 2026, start emailing those out in 2026, January 1st, 2026. Um, I'm at 1.16 p.m. We can no longer require a doctor's note if a person is out for three or more days. That is true unless it's going to be FMLA, an FMLA issue. That's such a common policy, isn't it? Like if it, yes. everyone says, if you're going to be absent three or more days, we need a doctor's note. And that's it is no a very, yeah, a yeah, no longer a thing. I remember FMLA is four or more consecutive days. So I think you can still draw the line at four if yeah. you think it's a serious health condition. And if we can't ask for documentation on why they're taking leave, then how do we know it's under the covered reasons? That is the million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> That is a perfect example. It just kind of shows you what happens on the floor of the, during the legislative session. Legislators don't always, they can't always imagine how this is actually gonna work in real life. And so, yeah, there are very specific reasons why you can take leave, but you are not allowed to ask for proof that those are the reasons that are being used. So, yeah. Um, let's see. What if your PTO is called vacation time, but it can be used for any reason? That's fine. If you can use yep. it for sick time, that's fine. Uh, I'm at 117. In regards to the notice, our PTO is much greater than what the sick, sick leave law mandates. What do we need to say? Is it as simple as please see your contract or our policies for info? Oh, no, if we're talking about, no, no there's a notice. Go to the Labor Department site that is that is in the slides and in the chat, and there is a specific notice um, that you need to distribute, and you will see that. It lists, it's kind of like similar to that FMLA notice. That's a notice of rights. It's much more specific than what you say there. Uh, what is a viable solution for tracking available and used sick leave if employers are prohibited from asking why the time is being used? I wouldn't say they're prohibited from asking. What do you? Yeah, I agree. You can ask. I mean, you can you can require the employee to tell you why they're not coming to work. Um, but they just don't have to give you documentation. And they say, I'm, I'm not coming to work because my car broke down, right? That's not a covered sick leave reason. If they tell you I'm not coming to work because I don't feel well, my child doesn't feel well, my spouse doesn't feel well, my brother-in-law doesn't feel well, or you know, then, then it's covered, right? And then you have yeah. to just say, okay, that's going to be one of the permitted reasons under the sick leave statute. So yeah, you can still ask. I think you can still ask why. And if it's a covered reason, you've got to <laughs> track that. Yeah, I would actually encourage you to ask because they really do only have 40 hours available here. And so it, I think that's actually a really common issue. People just call out and the manager never finds out why they called out. And so you can't necessarily count it as paid sick leave. Like you said, maybe their car broke down. And so you've right. got 
some types of absences that are protected, like if it's for sick leave and you start counting hours, if their car breaks down, that's not protected. That could be an unexcused absence and you note that separately. So you're keeping track of the types of absences for which you can be disciplined and the types of absences for which you cannot. So I'm, a, I'm like very much in favor of asking why someone's absent and keeping records of that. Great. Oh, we only have four minutes left. Um, let me see if I can find. Uh, I can't even find where you are. There's so many questions. I know, and it's and it's yeah. scrolling. Um, okay, how about this? If you have a collective bargaining agreement, what's required? So the collective bargaining agreement, there's language in the statute that says mm -hmm. the sick leave statute does not diminish an employee's rights under the collective bargaining agreement, but a collective bargaining agreement cannot afford an employee less than what the law gives them. So if your CBA says an employee gets six sick days instead of 40 hours, they still get six. The employer can't say, well, I'm gonna limit it to 40 hours, right? So it can't diminish the employee's rights under a CBA. But if a CBA says you get, you get 32 hours, I think you've got to bump that up to 40 to comply with the Connecticut sick leave law. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now there's some quirky language if you had an if you had a collective and I don't really want to get into it but if you had a collective bargaining agreement that's in effect currently that dates back to July one or July 2012 or is it yeah uh, July or, or January first 2012 or July of 2012 if you're subject to chapter I think it's 319 it's very very narrow um, you know if you're in that situation you've got an active collective bargaining agreement that has a date of 2012 then you should look into that further. But I don't want to, a vast majority will not. That's a, another one of these weird things in the statute. I'm not sure what the impetus there is. All right, I am up to 1.21 p.m. When you're counting the 121 days, is that, do you start counting on January 1st, 2025, or are you counting in the year 2024? I think it's 2025. Yeah, so yeah. you become yeah, I agree. Twenty twenty five. Um, okay, R regarding that one hundred twenty one days again, is there any minimum working hours requirement? Oh, good question. It just says day. So it's, it's you know as long as they once they work more than one hundred and twenty days or one hundred and twenty one or more days, then they're eligible to use the amount of sick leave that they would have accrued during the prior 120 days work. So it's not a minimum number of hours as long yeah. as they work. Yeah, so I think, I was thinking about this earlier. I think if someone comes into work and works a couple of hours and then goes home, I think that's a day. I agree. It's a day of work that moves you closer to being eligible to use your paid sick time. Um. Are we, I'm at 1.24 p.m. Are we required to allow rollover of unused sick time? Are we required? The answer is yes, unless you front load. And yeah. so, and front load means you make all the time they're eligible for under the sick leave statute available up front. So even though you allow carry, you, you have to allow carryover if you don't front load, that doesn't mean you have to allow them use more than 40 hours for sick leave purposes. You can still cap the total amount of sick leave that they use at 40 hours per year. Yeah, and so people can picture this. I think the reason, the, the theory behind that part of the statute was, you, you know, you may have employees who want to be able to use their paid time off in January. Exactly. And so let's say they accrue all this time and it takes them the whole calendar year to accrue it. And they've been saving up, saving up. And finally, at the end of the year in December, they've got 40 hours, but they would, don't want to use it until January. Right. You have to let them carry that over and use it in January. But that doesn't mean that then it, that next year they have double the amount of hours. Correct. Right? You still only get 40, but it's to allow people to use it in the beginning part of the year. Um, okay. Uh, how about if I, 
I'm at 1.25 p.m. We allow employees to take a payout of unused time at year end. If they opt for that, will we be in violation with not carrying it forward? So that's a really, really good question. That in the DOL, um, as I understand it, there's some some information that suggests that an employer may may give employees the option to sort of get paid out at the end of the year. So let's assume an employee did not use any of their sick time and they accrued 40 hours under the statute. An employer may say to the employee, look, we are willing to pay you out for those 40 hours. Or if you don't wanna be paid out for those 40 hours, then you can roll them into the next year if you'd like, but I don't think you can force it because the statute says, unless you front load, employees are permitted to carry over up to 40 hours into the next year. But I do think you can provide employees the option to either get paid out for those 40 hours and then begin accruing anew in the next year um, or decline the payout and just have it immediately available in January or whatever your next your next uh, benefit year is. Yeah. Yep, I agree with all of that. That's Those are payouts and incentives to, to take payouts instead of using the PTO or the sick time. Those are all really common questions. So listen, it's after two. I'm really sorry we couldn't get to it. We still have more than 100 more questions that we didn't get to. But I'm available. Nick is available. Nick's uh, email address is on his slides. My email address is diane.mokriski at cbia.com. That first person that wrote in right at the beginning at 109, if you wanna email me or Nick, I'm sorry I skipped you. You can email us directly and we'll answer that question because just because you were very first. Um, everyone else, if you've got questions and you are members of CBIA, you can call me or email me anytime and you can call or email Nick at any time. Also, Vincent, who is absent, you can email him as well. Vincent Faricello, uh, Nick's partner, who had a last minute uh, emergency. So thank you everyone for attending the webinar. We really appreciate the questions. We understand this is a really complicated issue. And we will continue to publish information on our website and uh, do what we can to get the word out. So thanks very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank, and you. Everyone. thank you, everyone. Yeah, have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.